Welcome to Crossroads on TVI, a show that showcases the Tamil Canadian community, their issues and their successes. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. Today we'll be talking about a somewhat painful topic for some, how to navigate the complexities of separation and divorce when you have decided to go separately in your relationship. But before we get there, we're going to speak to Dr. Guy Grenier, author of the bestseller, The 10 Conversations You Must Have Before You Get Married and How to Have Them. Dr. Guy Grenier is a psychologist, marital therapist, sex therapist, professor and author, obviously multi-talented, who has been helping individuals in relationships for over 20 years. He has also been an adjunct professor of human sexuality at the University of Western Ontario. Welcome to the show, Dr. Guy. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction uh, I'll, I'll leave it to your your viewers about whether i'm multi-talented okay promise me it's going to be uphill from here <laughs> so, so again you know what prompted you to write this book uh well i uh was writing a column for the free press for years and uh in my practice the same issues were coming up i would often take issues from my practice and the same issues are constantly coming up when i'm doing marital therapy um uh, sex money division of labor and 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 then a number of other issues that were coming up and i thought that's that's probably worth a column and i could probably get 10 columns out of that so i did that and it got quite a response i then took that response and i incorporated it into some of my lecture material and that got quite a response so I thought there's probably enough material here for a book, and and that's where that that, that was the genesis. So let's let's look at the the um, the issue of separation and divorce. Um, do you think it's on the rise? Do you think sort of um, divorce or separation rates are stable, declining? What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a little bit of variability, and 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 we'll get our our statistics from StatsCan, um, and and we've seen that that there has been sort of a slow steady rise but nothing epidemic and and there will be years where um, uh, the divorce rate goes down um, I think we can all agree the divorce rate is higher than we would like it it's just below 40 percent right now it's a little bit higher in the state it's about 50 percent um, and I think we can all agree that that's tragic um, but I wouldn't say that, that the divorce race is ran or the divorce rate is is increasing um, further, it's important to point out that the vast majority of people who get divorced get married again and sometimes get married again and again. Uh, the, the problem isn't marriage. The problem is doing marriage well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, much of my career has, has been about discovering that we don't teach people how to do marriage well. That's interesting that you bring that up, that, that there might be actually a responsibility somewhere in someone's hands to, to make sure that, that people are taught how to do marriage right. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think that the rest of us or government or, or you know, the sort of the, the broader public needs to make sure that that numbers don't get to any kind of uh, epidemic? Why is that important? Well, and we, we could argue whether it is epidemic or not. And, and, and I've written uh, uh, op-ed pieces uh, for example, saying that if we want to resolve our national debt problem, if we cut the divorce rate in half, um, <laughs> our national debt would disappear. All the lost costs to people like me and to divorce lawyers and setting up separate houses and psychological time off work and things like that, we could cut our debt in half. Um, I, I think marriage is one of these things that we sort of think is part of our DNA. We think it, it's going to happen like momentum. Uh, we, we, we make the same mistake about parenting. We think that there's something hardwired about us. Um, and while certainly we do like to be in relationships, we do like to be married, the skills that go along with that, um, the communication techniques, the problem-solving strategies, um, the, those aren't hardwired. Those do need to be taught. And, and as, as each couple sort of learns those things, some people are going to learn them quickly, some people are not going to learn them at all, some people are going to learn slowly, but invariably there's going to be substantial damage that happens while people are trying to learn those things. 
and it almost becomes a, a, an issue of attrition. Are they going to do more damage before they figure out how to do things um, and get to a point where they are communicating well, that they are problem solving well? And the, 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 the irony, and I suppose the tragedy, is that the people like me, the, the, the sexologists, the clinical researchers, the, the, the marital therapists, we know how. We know what makes a good relationship. We know what good relationships look like. We know what bad relationships look like. We know what the communication techniques are. We know what the problem-solving strategies are. And we can teach them. We just haven't been able to get them into the high school so far. Now, one of the things that you, you've also mentioned is that in relationships that, um, or marriages, that, that there's a, the rate peaks uh, when you're looking at uh, two to three two to three years after couples get married. Why, why is that? That's, that's very interesting to me. Yeah, and, and, we, and we see that, and we see that sort of across cultures, um, and we've seen that across time periods, that somewhere in the, the two to three year range, that's where the divorce rate peaks. If we look at marriages from uh, you know, one day to 30 years, it's at that two or three year mark where the, there's the highest rate of divorce. Um, one of the things that we know about relationships is that uh, at the beginning of the relationship, one of the things that, that helps cement and, and encourage people to, to work hard in their relationships is the novelty of being in a relationship and the novelty of their new partner. Um, but we also know that, that novelty can only last for so long. And it's in the same category. If you, you can only eat a, a new food for so long before it's no longer new or listen to a new song or watch a movie. That, that it no longer is new after a period of time. Well, it's the same thing with your partner. And we've actually been able to measure that time. Most people get between what we call, uh, or get what, uh, get six to, to 30 months in the stage that we call limerence. This just this uh, early honeymoon stage of a relationship. Um, and after that, somewhere between six and 30 months, so half a year to two and a half years, um, couples need to kind of transition from the novelty of their relationship, helping them solve problems, to actually taking on more of the role of solving problems and improving their communication on their own. And of course, when that wears off, it's not there. And not surprisingly, we do see the peak in divorce rate falling when that period starts to wear down. Interesting. Uh, that yeah, I found that that stat very very uh, curious. So. When, when we look at this book, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you must have sort of picked the topics for your 10 conversations that you mentioned from what you were hearing from the counseling that you were, do, you were doing in your practice. So what are these 10 conversations? Well, yeah, absolutely. They, they, they are plucked from my practice, but more than that, they're plucked from the research. Um, I'm sort of a hardcore scientist. As I say to my patients, if science doesn't talk about it, I don't talk about it. Um, uh, so uh, this isn't just sort of my, my gut feeling on it. When we, when we poll people, we, when we, when we uh, investigate uh, what are the issues that, that people uh, are most often in dispute, and consequently, which issues should people start learning to negotiate through as quickly as possible, that's where we come up with a 10. And, and, and some of them are, are not surprising at all. People need to be talking about money. They need to be talking about sex. They need to be talking uh, about careers. But some of them aren't so obvious. They do need to be talking about division of labor. Uh, they need to be talking about where they're going to live, what location they're going to, to live in. One of the most surprising ones is people need to talk about leisure. And, and people think, well, leisure, I mean, going to a movie or going on vacation, there's, how can that be a point of contention? Well, it turns out it's one of the top ten, um, and it catches people by surprise. Uh, so uh, the, the, there's, the, the, some of these things are surprising. Some of them are, are pretty obvious. And unfortunately, people think um, because some of them are, are obvious, like uh, having kids, they, they will have had the conversation, and the conversation will have been, well, do you want to have kids and how many? And, and those are two out of maybe, let's say, 30 components of what that conversation needs to involve. But because they've done those first two, they think they've had that conversation. And then they find out farther down the road that they really don't agree on a lot of things or they, there were a lot of misunderstandings or misapprehensions about where they thought they were in terms of having children. 
Interesting. That that's a very good point. So let's talk about something. You know, pick a couple of these conversations. I mean, let's take one that's very common. You know, I've heard that. I think we've discussed this before when we had a chat earlier on in this week. That some of the most common of that ten is again finance. Having the discussion on finance. Having the 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 discussion on on sex. So let's talk about finance. Um, okay. What kind of a conversation should people be having around finance? Well, we we need to start um, with gender expectations, and in fact, a few of these conversations need to start with a gender expectation, and and that gets people uh, starting to think about where did they get their ideas about men and women's roles in in relationships, and uh, sometimes people are under the misapprehension that somebody's role is more important than somebody else's. And you can imagine in a relationship, if somebody thinks that that the man's career is more important than the woman's career, um, right away we're going to have a point of contention that's going to need to be put on the table. Uh, so we need to start uncovering gender expectations and gender differences at the beginning of this conversation. Um, uh, an, another aspect, and a, and a very important aspect, is is what we call financial styles. And some people will have very risky styles, very very liberal styles. So where they're 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 interested in in investing in in uh, lower probability but higher return things, uh, while their partner might have a very conservative style. Very often, couples will make the mistake about debating what style is correct and no one is ever going to win that debate because mm. there isn't a right answer um, except for the people who own time machines and can look into the future. <laughs> um, short of those very special people, um, we, we waste time and we end up building a acrimony and, and hurting each other's feelings uh, rather than let's see if we can uh, uncover what each other's styles are. Let's see if they're the same. Let's see if they're different. If they're the same, it's probably going to be easier to, to, to decide what we're going to do with our money. If they're different, then we're going to have to come up with a problem-solving strategy that's not based on somebody right and somebody wrong, but on an accommodating style about, well, if you're not comfortable with high-risk investments and I am, how much of our resources are we going to do high-risk and how much are we going to do low-risk? And that changes the focus of the, the discussion or of the argument. We take it away from fault and, and we bring it into how do we keep both people satisfied within the relationship. So I'm trying to imagine, I mean, actually I'm even thinking of myself when I was getting into a relationship and trying to figure out when you would have this discussion and, and um, how you see people having these discussions. Is it sort of in a formalized setting with a counselor between themselves? It, 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 I'm sorry, you're still there? Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, I, the sound dropped out on my computer, sorry. Um, uh, ideally, people are having these kinds of conversations when it, it, it's clear we're, our relationship is, is building to something. Um, mm -hmm. th there's no danger, there's, no, th there's nothing toxic about any of these things. You could have all these conversations in a, well, you wouldn't have time, but you could have some of these on a first date if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make a lot of progress because they're a lot more complicated than most people think. Um, but certainly when people are beginning to think, hey, this, this, is a, this is a terrific person. This is someone I, 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 I'm really feeling strong feelings for. I'm really feeling a lot of love for. But now I need to find out if we're going to be compatible in the long run. And, and actually, one of the things that comes out of the science of relationships is, is there are three components that are needed. We need love. Um, uh, we need conflict management. We need communication roles. But we need this huge dose of similarity. The more people are similar, the more likely they're going to have a successful relationship. And that kind of flies in the face of the opposites attract. I was just going to uh, say that, yeah. Well, opposites absolutely attract. They just don't stay together. Opposites get divorced. Um, uh, similar people stay married and they stay happily married. Um, when people have opposite tendencies on a lot of important dimensions, not just on one or a few dimensions, but on a lot of important dimensions, they're going to be in conflict about how they want to spend their time, how they want to spend their money, what they think politically, what kind of art they like, what kind of food they like. And in a relationship where you're constantly uh, at odds with each other, um, about the things that are important to you, this is going to increase what we would call negative exchanges as opposed to positive exchanges. And we know relationships with a high number of positive exchanges, are the, those relationships are happier and they've got much more longevity. Interesting. The, um, so this, this can be a, a, 
a discussion that you start personally it doesn't have to be something that you have to actually have happen in front of a counselor or anything. You could start it in your relationship right now. Absolutely. And, and there, there's a role for a counselor, um, uh, less because it's sort of a clinical or, or a um, pathological issue. Um, a, a role for a counselor or somebody like me is more about efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that we can get you, we can identify the things, we can help solve the problem. It's kind of like, are, are, are you going to learn to golf on your own or are you going to hire a coach? Mm -hmm. And you can do it on your own, um, and, and most people do. Uh, if, if you want to speed things up, if you want to make sure there's nothing you're missing, then you can bring a counselor in. But, but uh, uh, with, a, with a little bit of guidance and with things like my book or even with some common sense, a, a lot of these things can be identified. So let me get to the book then. <laughs> Where can we get this book? I hear it's, it's sold out, actually. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, it's sold out. They're only available on the secondary. Even I don't have any more to, to, <laughs> to, to give to my clients. Um, the ebook version of it, though, I'm, I'm, I was literally working on the edit this morning. Uh, and hopefully, uh, in a few weeks, the ebook e version will be available from sort of the standard retailers. Um, and uh, people can download it to their iPod or their iPad or Kobo or I, I've got to learn all those things as I'm getting <laughs> it ready for that version. Okay. Well, you know what, when it, when it does come out on ebook, please do let us know because I know that uh, it's something we'd love to share with our audience. And it's really so a great problem to have to, to, to say that, oh, my books are all sold out. I've none left. I, I, I look forward to that day too, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for, uh, for taking the time to speak to us. And we hope to, to do this again once, uh, once your book is released. That'll be great, Manjula. Thank you for your time. Okay, take care. Uh, viewers, we're going to take a break now. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Savaraja. Stay with us. Welcome back to Crosswords on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Let's meet our panelist. Jill Riss Richmond is a registered social worker with a master's in social work and is a marriage individual and family counselor based in Durham. Dilani Gunaraja is a Toronto-based lawyer focused on several areas of law, including family law. Welcome to the show. I have to say, this is the most colorful panel we've had. I just, I think we should bring you back just based on that. I love this. <laughs> Great dressers. So let me bring up something. I had some serious questions for you, but I'm curious about this. So I was interviewing Dr. Guy Grenier, and he made the point that um, opposites attract and don't stay together. And when I said that, I saw both of you laugh. Why is that, Jill? Well, I think it's because we're attracted to the qualities in another person that we don't necessarily have ourselves or that we're not confident about in ourselves. And then um, those very same qualities often, because they're so different than our usual personalities or selves, um, end up in a marriage, they end up causing friction sometimes. And that's um, quite a common theme, I think, in marital and family therapy. Is that yeah. something you notice as well? <laughs> yes, but um, I have to give my answer based on the legal prospect of it and I think it's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I think I, as long as you have ways to work through mm -hmm. it, I think there's a way around it. But I just found that really interesting mm -hmm. because everyone's always said opposites attract to me, you yes. know. And so the old that, adage. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an old adage. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about separation and divorce and, and take it to the South Asian community. Do you think it's still a taboo topic in the community, Delani? I, I, I don't think so, mm -hmm. um, because um, our community has changed and they have advanced a lot. So when you look at um, it, 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 it all depends on the facts and the situation. It becomes a taboo if, if it is uh, the situation, it, it depends on the situation if it's a wife who has been 
uh, coming from an abusive family mm -hmm. and the husband has abused her and she comes out of it, I don't think it's a taboo. But whereas if, if the husband who has abused the wife in this case, then of course he's, he's looked at in a different anger because he's, he's, the, he's not the victim actually. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the situation. It depends on the angle. That That's correct. Interesting. Jill, I don't know if you want to put in your two cents. Um, I agree that it's becoming less taboo. I think there still is that stigma, however, mm -hmm. in um, not just the Southeast Asian community, but in communities at large, there is still that stigma of divorce because people are so hopeful going into marriage mm -hmm. and it involves the entire family, you know, extended family and friends, and there's a lot of hope involved. And when it doesn't work out, there's a lot of disappointment. There can often be a lot of shame attached, embarrassment. Um, it's a grieving process working through separation and divorce. And we're going to get to t talking with you about how people can sort of try to work through it before mm -hmm. they get to that stage. But, you know, I did want to ask a question about, you know, what are the challenges that people face when they have made the decision that they're going to separate or get divorced? What are some of the... First, they, they, they don't have any help, especially um, counseling. Mm -hmm. um, they need the family at that time, mm -hmm. and they need to know the legal uh, aspect of it. The, what are their rights? Mm -hmm. They have no clue. Some people, they don't have any clue. They just, um, uh, there are situations where they come, they just leave, and they just wait. They don't do a thing. Mm -hmm. And say, for example, they, um, I mean, the counselling part to, I don't think we have lots of Tamil speaking counsellors who can help them. So they might feel that it, it they may are be a little bit easier. Okay. To, to be able to discuss their issue with other, someone Tamil speaking who, who has a cultural context. Right. Yeah. And plus they have an issue about um, speaking out. They just don't want to tell anybody their problems. As you say, it's a shame for them. But. What I'm saying is, uh, my first question when you asked me that divorce is not a taboo, yes, that is not, a, they don't consider it, but I mean, they don't want to talk about it. And if they come out of it, they are fine. Because as long as they get their counseling and they need all the, get the I help. I heard about this. I think it's called, there's a term for it. I believe it's called something like in popular media, not in anything scientific, but it's called apparently, um, an invisible divorce, which is mm -hmm. you have a divorce within your marriage. Right. Um, so everyone thinks you're still together, but because you don't want to sort of have to leave and so right. you must encounter that occasionally too. I have encountered that. I've never heard the term invisible divorce. However, it's I don't interesting. think it's scientific. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like people basically maintain the the facade, right. but inside they're living separate lives. They're right. maybe even sleeping separately. Yes. Right. You know, or separate finances. Mm -hmm. All of it. That's more common than you would think. Really, yes. and I think mm -hmm. ac across a broader community, mm -hmm. not just the South Asian one. I hear. No. Yes. No. no. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> I just want to say I think it's so important that people get their legal advice and people, my clients feel a lot better once they go through that process, when they know where they stand legally, they know about custody issues, they know about finances, they have that legal support. It's so important, it makes them feel a lot better and then they can really you know, work on the therapy part of it. But without knowing their, they you know, where they stand legally, it, it you really You make an interesting things. point because there were a, a couple of people that I just called to get their opinions um, just on the topic itself. And one of the things that came, come, uh, that came up, and these were people that just happened to be divorced or separated, some of them remarried, but one of the things that came up is they did not know what to do next mm -hmm. legally. And they didn't understand half of the terms. And you've told me you've encountered that. Yes, they have no clue at all. They sometimes, they go and sign the documents without even reading the documents. Wow. And if the husband or the wife, I mean, in most of the cases in our communities, the husband will tell, go to another lawyer and sign the documents. And she doesn't, she just says, okay, I just want to, okay, he told me to sign it, let me sign it. I'm like, no, you can't sign it because you have, I mean, I as a lawyer, I have to look into a lot of things too. For example, if you are going to do a domestic contract, you have to make sure that I need to know what is the financial background of the, both the parties before I agree to for my client to sign something to. Mm -hmm. So they have to be careful. They don't. Uh, our community people they have to be, have to be knowledgeable about uh, what is happening with respect to 
custody, access, um, support, and equalization, what it means. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to that in the mm -hmm. second segment for sure, because I think there are people that are curious about it. So Jill, sure. let's talk about counseling for a bit. Sure. I mean, one of the things that I ran into at the start of the year, I'm embarrassed to say, is that I had to actually learn, because we had a psychologist on here, Okay. Um, what the difference is between a therapist, okay. a psychologist, and a psychiatrist. Okay. So perhaps you can explain. So if you think of therapist, it's a functional title. It's what that person is doing, similar to the title researcher. That's what they're doing. And many different professionals do research, like mm -hmm. many do therapy. So therapy is helping and changing, making those necessary changes. Um, however, the professions of social work, psychology, and psychiatry are different. They're different training, but there are similarities as well. So that's why it's confusing. The similarity is they can all do therapy, um, but... Um, a uh, psychiatrist is a medical professional, with, you know, they understand the whole workings of the body and the, the brain. The psychologist tends to work with individuals and not with families or systems. A social worker works with the individuals, families, community at large, society. Um, a psychologist and a psychiatrist both diagnose mental health disorders in the DSM from the DSM. And, and a DSM is? A Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay. So that's the whole book of different diagnoses that okay. a psychiatrist or a psychologist could give you. A social worker like myself does not diagnose. We cannot give a label. Although we understand the diagnoses, we don't give those labels out to clients. And what we do is we try to unravel the whole story. Mm. How did that person get to be called, let's say, depressed? Or um, how did... Um, this crisis happened. Let's look at the whole story and where did they come from? How did they get there to help understand um, how we can make a difference in getting things back on track? Now, some of the men that I spoke to, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to just because counseling is an option for you, when you, uh, my sense is when you feel that you're having difficulties in your relationship mm -hmm. before you go to any of the the next few stages, it's something that you can try using. But actually, I shouldn't shouldn't say men, though it was men that mentioned this to me. I'm sure men and women run into this. But some of the f uh, men that I spoke to specifically said that uh, they just did not have that faith in counseling. Mm -hmm. Um, and they hadn't even tried it. Right. Um, I don't know if you run into that. All the time. It's, it's very fear-based because it's fear of the unknown. And it's, change is always scary for any community, for anyone. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to think about, well, even though things aren't great now, going in and talking to a stranger and, you know, what, what would they know about me? A lot of these fears of, you know, revealing the most personal things about themselves. It's, it's very scary. It can be very intimidating at first. A lot of my clients, the first time they tell me, I was so afraid to come. After the first session, they generally say that wasn't bad at all. I really enjoyed talking. It felt really good to get it all out. And they feel better from that point on, usually. I mean, sometimes people, you know, it, some things are difficult and painful to discuss in therapy too. So you have to keep that in mind that not everything's um, easy, yes. right? It's, yeah. It can be a difficult process, but that generally people feel a lot better once they start opening up, whether that be to a therapist or a clergy person or to friends or... Whoever. So what happens in a situation if there's a, a one party into a relationship, mm -hmm. perhaps the man or the woman, who wants to see a counselor but yeah. the other doesn't? You must run into that as well. Yes. And, and how do you how do you all the time? Well, what ha with if someone comes on their own and says my spouse doesn't want to come, um, I assure them that you know if after the assessment, I assure them that um, things may get better for them, or we're hoping things get better, but that also them making changes in therapy, it will indirectly affect their spouse as well. So even though that spouse doesn't want to come, there's still going to be changes coming in store. Interesting. Okay. So that's how you, okay. Right. So there's still going to be changes, even if one spouse comes, that spouse staying at home, it's, you know, usually they end up coming because they feel the changes, see the changes, and then they start wanting input into okay. that they start to like the changes and things are better so it is possible yeah. for just one one of the party of the two to, to absolutely work that's very common it often happens with kids too that maybe someone would like their child to get therapy or um, a sibling to get it or whoever they come on their own and then things start to snowball from there now, do people need referrals to actually go see no, counselors they do not you don't so it's not a family doctor thing you just 
Many people do go to a family doctor, and that's a very good idea as well to rule out any medical conditions. Mm -hmm. But you definitely don't need to see a family, you know, family doctor to get a referral of any sort. Um, now, one thing that some people may want to try is going through employee assistance programs. Some people have an EAP program through their work. Um, some people have private insurance through their work. So those are good things to check out in advance because um, private therapy is not uh, inexpensive. So um, it's good to have that knowledge as well going in and then you can be more informed as, as to who you can see. Interesting. So this is, I mean, we've talked about counseling as a, as a potential option mm -hmm. for when, you're, when you run into difficulties in the relationship. I, I'm wondering if within the South Asian community itself, and I know that across the board people can be resistant to counseling sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it is... Um, it happens more in the South Asian community, that resistance to, mm -hmm. to leveraging counseling as an option? Yes. Yes, <laughs> okay. I agree. A lot of nodding. Okay, I'll yes. have you go first. I have, I, uh, it's very difficult to send a client to a counseling program. And they think, uh, they have the perception thinking that, oh, uh, am I crazy to go for counseling? No, no, you're not crazy. You just have to go because it will help you in your relationship or if there is a breakdown in your relationship, it's good to go for counseling because you have to come out of it. Mm -hmm. You are going to have the pain in you that you have to come out of it. It's not an easy thing. Breaking a relationship, maybe for one year or two years or maybe 10 years, it's not an easy one. There's definitely a grief process involved There's a grief that. process. And so you're support. talking about counseling after they've even gotten... Before or after, after. yes. Interesting. Both. Mm -hmm. You need counseling. Mm -hmm. um, as um, we have been lawyers sign the divorce papers, we have to certify that we have encouraged the clients to go for counseling. And so we try to, but if it's a like domestic violence issue and there's no in my part, if I don't think that it is good to send the client for counselling, then I won't talk about it. I will talk to my client, but I know it's not going to work mm -hmm. because she has gone through so much that it's not no use sending the person for counselling. But I have to send her for counselling for therapy and uh, for her self-esteem and for her, you know, the other individual part, therapy, the individual yeah. therapy. Mm -hmm. Jill, I don't know from your experience if you want to... Oh, I completely agree with that, that in not just the South Asian community, but all kind of Eastern-based um, communities, that it's much more difficult to accept the notion of going mm -hmm. to therapy. And I think that in North America, um, the culture has been that we've grown up to be kind of insular, where independence is valued. I think it's a real strength of the Southeast um, Asian community that people rely on their community so much. Mm -hmm. That is such a strength and I think that um, it's almost to a fault in this situation because they're so um, involved with the community that they're really afraid that if it gets out they're divorced mm -hmm. it just spreads like wildfire. I've heard so many patients or clients say um, if I get separated or divorced or if I do this or say this that not only will it go out through my entire um, community today but it'll go overseas as well and I have family and friends there, and it just will basically ruin my life. Mm -hmm. So there's that fear too. Now, mm -hmm. why why do you think that there is that? Um, why do you think there is that resistance to taking counseling? Because I know when we spoke earlier, you said that in sort of prior work that you had done, mm -hmm. that you had noticed that sometimes people from such communities tend to use the system when the problem peaks, mm -hmm. right? So whenever there's a, a mental health issue or even, and when it is something drastic, like mm -hmm. I'm leaving him today, mm -hmm. they use the system as opposed to right. they could have, you know, or I'm leaving her today, you know, yeah. instead they could have. Why do you think that's there? I think that's true for every culture. Okay. That people generally leave it too late until there's a crisis mm -hmm. um, because there's generally a resistance to counseling in every culture. But with this, of these East Asian community, I think there's even more of that because of issues of power imbalance in relationships, which are here in North America as well, but maybe heightened in um, the Asian culture. Um, um, different notions of privacy mm -hmm. and mm. different notions of, um, yeah, different privacy, um, power imbalances of relationships, generally fear of change. And that's really hard. 
of, an in, of a, someone that we don't know, a stranger, going to come in and maybe be judgmental, going to judge what we're doing as a family or so as a couple. So here's an easy question for you because you've studied this, you can tell me. What is the difference that you think counseling can, uh, can make? And I want you to address mm -hmm. that. I'm curious what it can do pre, you know, when you're still trying mm -hmm. to resolve things and what it can do after mm -hmm. if you've decided that, you know, we are getting separated because I've just heard that there are people that actually do counseling after. So can well, you speak to both of sure, those? Sure, sure. Uh, counseling in general, I think what it does is gives you a new perspective. And when you're in a crisis, you, be, you get tunnel vision. You start to see the world as smaller and smaller and smaller. Your problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. It kind of overtakes your perspective. Mm -hmm. So counseling just, it can open up a new perspective for you. And you see the problem from different angles, different mm -hmm. ways, different solutions, different options. Um, it can be a stepping stone to many different resources, mm -hmm. like a lawyer, like many endless, uh, I can't even think of how many different support networks, you know, just an endless amount of support networks, um, a confidant, a person who's completely non-judgmental. Um, and a lot of people don't have that. They don't have one person they can sit and talk to in a confidential way that's non-judgmental. That's yeah. interesting. Now, when what are, if you look over the um, the things that people come to see you about mm -hmm. when they're in that um, frame of mind and they're trying to resolve things, mm -hmm. I heard um, Dr. Guy say that some of the things that he sees, he sees the same same uh, problems come up. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned, you know, um, discussions around sex that don't happen, conversations around um, around career. Um, what Children, you want to do for finances. Do, do you notice, what are some of the main things that you see recurring themes when you're doing couple or marital therapy? Oh, well, the biggies would be um, finances, children, um, sex. Um, yeah, those would be the big three, I would say. So what, yeah. are, what are some things that you think couples can do before they actually seek counseling? Couples that are, that are thinking of getting married? I mean, I wish that, I'm sure yes. that you sometimes sit down and, and say, yeah. after you've been working for a while, that you yes. say to people, I wish I could have given you this. Yes. What would that be? Well, you can take a premarital course, right? Um, uh, preparing to get married it's course. The marriage prep course. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So those really make a difference. Yeah, I think your... they open up the conversations. They're basically weekend courses you can take, sign up for. Mm -hmm. Some people are required to take them through their church and other people it's just an option. Um, but um, they open up conversations. They encourage the conversation to keep happening throughout the marriage, obviously. But they really just get you to have conversations about different things that you probably hadn't thought about having before. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Are there books that you recommend that, that you've either read or passed on to clients that you like? There's several different books. Um, one specifically, and I can't think of the offer on the spot, but it's called The Dance of Anger. It's very oh, good. That's a famous one. Yeah. I've actually even heard of it. <laughs> and I think there's spin-offs as well. Different there's a types dance of, of intimacy There's dances too. of all sorts of things now. Okay. There's been spin-offs. Um, but that's one. I, the author, I'm stumped right now. But How do you like what you do? I love what I do. Um, it feels like a really just a natural fit for me. It doesn't feel like work. It just feels, it's challenging, but uh, it feels like a really a good fit for my personality. Interesting. When yeah. did you decide that you wanted to be a, a counselor? It was a gradual um, decision because I'd really just studied the things I were, was interested in. Mm -hmm. And social work, um, the foundation of social work is psychology and sociology, and I love both. And... Um, I love people. I'm fascinated by people and systems and um, culture, and that's just the it's the application of all those things. I just love it. Wonderful. Uh, this it's great to have people on that actually specialize in this. Thank you. So, Delani, I'm going to leave the last answer to you before we go to a break, and then we're going to talk about um, uh, legal things. Um, you've told me that when clients come to you, that the first thing that you ask them is if they've they've looked for counseling. What do you find? Do you find that people have actually used counseling before they actually go down the path of either getting legally separated or divorced? No, they have not gone for professional counseling. So what they have done is they have actually gone to either to speak to the extended family and then try to try to uh, speak to that one partner goes to one his side of the family and the other partner goes to the other side of the family Which I think it doesn't help. Well, they're not experts. I would say right. and they're biased right. too. For, that's good. Yeah. That's true So it doesn't work at all. So I, my advice is that they should go for a professional counseling. And do people take that? Um, 
They do, um, because if that is, you know, when you when they come to speak to me, uh, when they when they put their trust on me, mm -hmm. I guess they will listen to me. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that I. I, had, I, I think when you communicate to them, that's, and when you listen to them, uh, they just, the trust is built. Amazing. And I would imagine that when there are dire circumstances, you know that this, there's no point uh, in counseling. But I think for other things, Yes, right? yes. There are situations I'm like, okay, there are these other numbers. Can you please go? So, and then come back to me, come and speak to me. Mm -hmm. So they, some, some people they do and they come back and they say it didn't work okay. because such and such a thing happened or I would say why not. So there must be some reason I, I can't understand they come back mm -hmm. or they wouldn't have gone proper counseling and they come and tell me they, did, they went but it didn't work. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure but they, they, I, I tend to send them for counseling. Interesting. Well, that's good to hear. So yes. we're going to take a break now. You guys uh, can't leave. You have okay. to stay because we're going to go on to the second part of talking about the aftermath a little in the legal world because a lot of the language there to me is still, um, I still don't understand it and I'd love to have you explain it to me and the audience. We are going to take a break now. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Stay with us. We can talk off the record now. Welcome back to Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. And uh, while we were just chatting in our break, Dilani was talking about how she loves her job as well, which is amazing to hear. How long have you been a lawyer? Um, lawyer in Canada for seven years. Seven years. Actually, when I started practicing, I wanted to do estate law. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was so amazing because I was, when they come, uh, they come and tell me stories. and. I love to listen more than the law. I was trying to listen. I think they thought I was um, listening to their story. So, which is like, you know, you know, when you listen to the story, they build up trust. They get the Absolutely. confidence. Absolutely. It's a listener. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, uh, and then some, some cases I would take this personally, but I don't now. When I started, I used to take it personally. And, um, and I, because, most of them, they come to you because they are in stress or they are in need. Mm -hmm. And there is somebody to listen to you. And I think I, more than legal services like fees and all, I'm like more helping them. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, because it's either child support, custody mm -hmm. or spousal support. And um, more than, division of property doesn't come too much. I mean, it comes, but when, when they come, it's, but do I pay child support or how do I get custody? How do I get access? Yeah. Or what do I do with the matrimonial home? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's challenging. Friday night I get calls usually about access. He didn't bring me access to the child. What do I do? So it's like, you know, you had to contact. Where do I contact? I had to contact the other side lawyer. So it's challenging but interesting. Okay, keeps you running. Right. <laughs> And every case is different. Absolutely. I think you both said, said that at different mm -hmm. times to me. Mm -hmm. I think you said that to me on the phone too, that you can't, nothing is, you can't, it's not a cookie cutter, right? No. So let's talk about one question that, that I was curious about is, if you could explain to me the difference between being just living apart, because mm -hmm. you've decided to live apart, um, being legally separated and divorce. Okay. So living apart means you're not addressing any of the legal issues. Like... If you have children, you have not dealt with custody. You have not de dealt with child support. But you're right, as, as a mother, if the mother is having the child, she needs to get child support. Whether, uh, who has custody, so who is going to sign any documents when she, the child goes to school. And as a mother, if she has lived with the husband for a long time, what about spouse's support? And what about division of property? Like, say, for example, uh, if there's a house jointly held or things solely registered with the husband's name or bank accounts, who is going to deal with it? And upon a death of one person, one of the uh, spouses, who has the right? So who is going to apply? They, he's, she's still the spouse. Mm. 
So, so when you're living apart, you're simply just living apart. But when you're legally separated, you actually have have worked this all out legally uh, on paper. Is that like right? a separation agreement? Okay. So they would have done a separation agreement dealing with custody, access, child support, spouses support, and division of property. And do you have to have had lived apart for like a year or two years in order to be legally separated? No. No. Okay. No. And this it's, is just me having no clue. So no. Okay. That's for divorce. divorce. You have okay. to have one year of separation. Okay. To get the divorce certificate, so. you can apply for divorce, but you won't get the divorce certificate uh, until you get the after until one year passes. I'm trying to understand why someone would would want to get if they if they don't plan to stay together anyway, why would they be legally separated and not divorced? And I'm sorry that is such a naive question, but I'm just curious. Um, legally separated means you, you are dealing with the issues, but they don't want the divorce. As you are, your first question was, is a taboo. Okay. So maybe they don't want to. They, they're dealing with the issues of property, children, parenting issues, uh, everything has been dealt with, but they don't want to deal with the divorce. So he, she is still the spouse. Oh, so divorce is, it's, I see, because they don't want to take that final step. step. Interesting. Okay. And uh, talk to me about sort of, you know, their implications on children, obviously. They're children in, in the marriage, right? How does it, how do, how do they get affected through things like custody battles? Talk to me about oh that. Oh my God. The different types of... I don't think. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you go to courts now, uh, and if you, uh, the judges, most of them, uh, unless there is an abusive father who has assaulted the children, mm -hmm. the the courts tend to give the ch the pair the both the parents joint custody. Okay. Because they don't want a sole custody uh, or or a shared parenting they like to give. Because if you give a, a mother a sole custody and no access to a father, um, you know the children are affected mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's always always uh, in fact i had a case last week too where the father has never seen the the two children and they they are almost 12 and 14 too but the ch judge gave the father telephone access because you because he want the judge wants the father to build up the relationship because the children are going to be ultimately affected it's yeah. not it's, it, it, it looks very, uh, when you get a custody paper, oh yeah, mom got sole custody, but, and you know, I mean, as, as parents, they have to support uh, to, to be, for the, for the children's sake, they don't get long through, but they have to make sure that the children's educations are dealt to be, they are dealt together, like they work out together mm -hmm. for the children's sake in the children's matters. Exactly. But not, I mean, you, you, you disagree on certain things, but, don't show it in front of the children that you have a decision. But you have to work together to, to make sure that they have some stability. That's correct. Right. Because it, it's, it affects a let, later on when they are like adults, 21, 22. I'm sure she will agree, she will agree mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. It affects them. Mm -hmm. they, they, they need both parents. It's not one. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so let's, I, we actually may be close to our final question. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear this from you because you've obviously been doing this uh, for a while. You know, I'm not in any way saying that people should now go out in big numbers and get, if things are not working out for you, you need to deal with it. And then if you can't deal with it, then you have to get separated and divorced. But I, I know that there are people out there that tell me that I've contacted that say, that say there is life after divorce. Can you give us a couple of final words? Like, you know, some of the maybe men and women that you've met a couple of years down the road. I mean, how do they, how do they cope? How are they making it? Um, and what, what tools can they use to, to sort of um, kind of build back their life again? Uh, I, I, it all depends on each individual. I, could, I can't say that everything, everybody will be a success yeah. after separation. Mm -hmm. Some people, they tend to think about the past. It's a difficult journey. Yeah. yeah. Some people, they move on with their life. They mm -hmm. change. They find somebody new. Um, Can I, I'll just say yeah. that's counseling. Yeah. It's a grieving process for sure, but it's really important to stay positive and focus on what you're doing well. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much 
sadness around that time, it can be, you can get easily sucked into all the, the failures or what perceived failures. So try to really focus on what you're doing well, uh, what you're doing well with your children, focus on having fun with them and um, try not to make too many changes, big changes all at once. So if you're going through separation and divorce, maybe is not the best time to jump into a new relationship or a new job or a new move. Just, you know, kind of one change at a time. Mm -hmm. um, keep the balance, right? And keep your expectations realistic. Don't expect too much from yourself in the year or two following that, probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. right? Because it's sort of a slow Yeah, it, it's not an easy one. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for being frank about all of that. <laughs> thank you for it's having me. It's been a me. pleasure having you on. It's been such a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, Angela. Thank, thank you. you. And, and especially for, the, for the, your frankness <laughs> in, in talking about these issues. Well, there you have it. Um, if you have any feedback, certainly call us, drop us an email, or you can also contact us through Facebook, which seems to be a way that a lot of you do. So thank you all for joining us. You've been watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Savaraja. Tamil Nadu Tamil Nadu Bimbam Ungal TV